Your generosity fuels all of Westside's efforts to make disciples, equip families, and share Christ's love here and around the world. For the past decade, Westside has been caring for the spiritual and physical orphan in India. Through the holistic model of church planning, orphan care, and community development, you are a part of bringing the transformational power of the kingdom of God to the Hindu communities. Through your generous giving, over 250 micro churches have been planted. 340 women in 10 villages have launched successful microfinance enterprises, and almost 1,000 Indian children have participated in our One Life sponsorship program. These past 10 years, many of you have joined us on these trips to India, and you have met the children whose lives have been touched by your all in giving. Each child has a story, and each story reflects your generosity. Gangadhar was a child whose mother abandoned him at the young age of nine. A local village elder took him to the Westside supported New Life Children Home, where he was fed, clothed, and cared for. Not only did Gangadhar get his physical needs met, he was also given the gospel. This opened his heart to Jesus, and he made the personal decision to be baptized. Since 2011, I've been able to travel to India every year, and I've been able to meet with Gangadhar every time. I've loved the relationship that we've been able to build, and it is so exciting to see what Gangadhar is up to now. Nenu puru prastho nenu bachelor degree ante degree chaduthnanu ante puru prastho naaku jeevinchadaniki oka life antu yarpadindi oka goal antu yarpadindi and alage nenu etarlaki cheppadaniki kuda naaku avakasam dorikindi nenu alage na villages tho kalisi nenu pan cheyadaniki naaku avakasam kuda undi అలాగే ఇప్పుడు నేను ప్రస్తుతం జీసస్ క్రైస్ట్ గురించి నేను ఇతరులకు చెప్పడానికి కూడా నాకు ఇప్పుడు ప్రస్తుతం అవకాశం దొరికింది నాకంటూ ఒక గుర్తింపు అంటూ ఏర్పరిచాడు అలా అందుకు దేవుడు ఒక గుర్తింపు ఇచ్చాడు కాబట్టి దేవుని అందు నేను నిరీక్షణ కలిగి ఉంటాను అలాగే అందరికీ దేవుడి గురించి అందరికీ కూడా చెప్తున్నాను ప్రస్తుతం ఒకప్పుడు ఫస్ట్లో నేను హాస్టల్లో చదవకముందు దేవుడు అంటే ఎవరో నాకు తెలియక ముందు నా పేరు గంగాధర్ కానీ ప్రస్తుతం ఇప్పుడు నేను దేవుడిని తెలుసుకొని దేవుడిలో రక్షణ పొంది దే దేవుడు అంటే ఎవరో తెలిసి తెలిసిన తర్వాత నేను బాప్తిజం తీసుకున్న తర్వాత నా పేరు డానియల్గా మార్చుకున్నాను మీ సపోర్ట్ అంటే మీరు నన్ను ఈ న్యూ లైఫ్లో చదువుకోవడానికి అవకాశం లేకపోతే నాకంటూ ఒక ఫ్యూచర్ అంటూ ఉండేది కాదు అంటే నాకంటూ ప్రజల్లో గుర్తింపు అంటూ ఉండేది కాదు మీరు సపోర్ట్ చే సపోర్ట్ చేయడం వల్ల చేయకపోవడం వల్ల చేయడం వల్ల నాకు ఫ్యూచర్ ఏర్పడింది అలాగే నాలాగే సో చాలామంది ఒక హండ్రెడ్ మెంబర్స్ వేల కొద్దీ ఇలాగ అవకాశం కోసం ఎదురు చూస్తున్నారు మీరు ఇలాగ ఎంతోమంది హండ్రెడ్ మంది చిల్డ్రన్స్కి హెల్ప్ చేయడం చేస్తున్నారు కాబట్టి వెస్ట్ ఫ్యామిలీ చర్చ్కి థ్యాంక్ యూ బికాస్ ఆఫ్ యూ జనరసిటీ లైఫ్స్ ఆర్ బీయింగ్ చేంజ్డ్ విత్ ఇండియా You helped make these blessings possible through your faithful giving. Thank you. Hello church. It is so great to see you. I want to remind you of something particularly if you're new. The work that Westside is doing here uh, in Lenexa and in Speedway and all around the, uh, Kansas City is pretty awesome. Uh, but we do some amazing work around the world and you just saw a beautiful picture of that. And I want to remind you that every dollar that you contribute to the Westside Family Ministry, a portion of that goes to support this work. So this is not something that Westside those people are doing. This is something that we Westside Family Church have a bunch of involvement and investment in. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your continued investment in this ministry. Aren't we through God's help doing some awesome things in India, South Africa, and Thailand? Let's give it up for God in that, man. That's pretty cool. 
We didn't plan this, uh, but uh, it but just happens. God has a way of organizing that. Uh, as we highlighted this work in India, uh, our primary leader that, or, that works with us in India happens to be in the service today. And I want you to give a West Side welcome. You know what that means, church. A West Side welcome to one of our own. His name is Inash Kumar from India. Let's give it up for Inash. Come on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Come on over here. Thank you. Thank you. You can remain standing. Let's just remain standing. I've asked... I've asked uh, 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 Inash to open us up in a word of prayer. Yeah, sure. Loving God, Heavenly Father, once again we come to thy presence to worship you, to glorify your name. I'm here with a heart of thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, bringing me out of darkness into the marvelous light. Mm -hmm. I'm so uh, proud to be called as a children of you, Lord. As we have come together to worship you, help us to worship in truth and spirit. Thank you, Lord, as we are waiting to hear from you and just speak to us. I am so thankful to this precious uh, the church and the precious people, those who are here. Thank you for the heart that you have given to us uh, to be a blessing for the missions around the world. It's such a blessing and honor to be partnered with these precious people, Lord. And can you bless us? We are here to give glory and honor to you. Thank you, Lord, uh, for this precious time. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Let's give it up one more time for Enosh. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. God bless you. Well, these are exciting times around Westside Family Church for sure. We have uh, our folks that are over in the South Sanctuary meeting and worshiping right now. We have our folks at the Speedway Campus who last week started their third service. We have all of the wonderful people that watch us online all over the world, a group that meets in Paraguay, a group that meets in France. Isn't that the coolest thing? We have a group that meets at Cordillera Ranch in San Antonio, Texas, of all places. Yeehaw for that. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, our uh, Westside Family Church Leavenworth Campus uh, which is a major part of our family, is joining us for the Believe experience as well, but it doesn't stop there. Harvest Ridge Church in Kansas City, along with Colonial Presbyterian Church, today begins the Believe journey with us. God is a great God. He's moving in mighty ways. But not only that, today, and I need you to give it up for them, today uh, my message and this service is being piped into our students. So here we go. Uh, for those of you in the South Sanctuary and the North Sanctuary, if we cheer for the loud enough, they will hear it in the East and West venues, okay? And even you online, you can contribute to this. Ready? On the count of three, let's give it up for our students. One, two, three. We love you guys. Woo! Way to go. And on top of all of that, today, to create more room for this great Believe experience, we are starting our fifth live teaching service here at Lenexa at 12.30, right after this service, in the South Sanctuary, and I may just be playing the banjo over there. So I would encourage you to check that out uh, in the weeks to come. Invite some more people as we venture into this amazing journey. So I ask you the question, are you ready? Are you ready to get started? We have a very important message to lay down today from God's Word that's going to set the stage for how this whole belief thing really works. So let's pray and we'll get to work. Father, thank you for the opportunity of being with these awesome people. Uh, those in the room right in front of me, those watching around the world, we are so excited and so anticipating the way in which this journey is going to influence and affect our lives, our families, our neighborhoods, our church, the city and around the world. And we just pray, Father, that you would give us the courage to follow you as you cast light on the path. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus and all West Siders shouted. Amen. Let me begin with the story. There was a young mother who uh, was making pancakes one Saturday morning for her two young boys. And the two boys began to argue over who was going to get the first pancake. 
And so mother decided to use this as a teaching moment. And she said to her children, to her boys, if Jesus were here, he would say to his brother, you go ahead and have the first one, I can wait. To which the older brother, without missing a beat, turned to the younger brother and said, you be Jesus. I love that story. It is so cute. But more than just being cute, it exposes a humongous idea that is taught in the Bible. It is a big idea. And if you're taking notes, I want to ask you to write this down. And that is this. The ultimate goal of the Christian life, the ultimate goal of the Christian life is to be like Jesus. If I were to summarize what I have read, particularly in the New Testament, as the desired outcome of God in your life, I would define it this very way. As a matter of fact, Paul, in the book of Romans, chapter 8 and verse 29, he says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. This passage is saying that becoming like Christ, being conformed into the image of Christ, is not only your destiny, but it is your predestiny. That is, before you were even born, God set out for you to be on a journey that would lead you to become like Jesus. The notion or the idea is progressively, as people begin to stare at you, that at some point they're going to do a double take. And you're going to say, whoa, what's wrong? He says, they'll say, well, for a moment there, I thought I was looking at Jesus. And you'd say, well, not quite yet, but stay tuned. That's where this thing is heading. For you to be conformed from the inside out to day by day, not only for your sake, but for the sake of your family and all the people that you touch and minister to, for you to be Jesus to them. Mm. Now, the question is, how does one go about becoming like Jesus? This is the question. I think the answer is found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, in verse 7. I want you to read it out loud with me. Ready? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. This passage is essentially saying, you are what you think. Your sum, the sum total of your entire belief system essentially is going to turn around and automatically make you into the person that you are today. But it's not just what you understand in your head, but this passage is saying what you think in your heart. That's a disruptive idea. So we ask the question, how does one go about thinking from the heart? And here's how it works. All day long today and for the rest of your life, uh, your mind is going to be taking in ideas, thoughts, suggestions. You're going to be required to make decisions upon these ideas. And once your mind has sort of processed this information, develops a sense of feeling about it, it will send these ideas 12 inches south to the heart for consideration. It is the heart that is the executive center of your will, and it is not until the heart decides to embrace the idea that it actually makes a difference in your life. Did you understand that? You can understand any idea, even a biblical idea, but it won't make any difference in your life until your heart decides to embrace it, to purchase it, to own it to believe it. That explains why you can, ha- you can have, say for example, a man who attends church every time the doors are open, is maybe a deacon in the church and carries around with him the big family Bible, not only to church, but everywhere he goes. And yet, behind closed doors at home, he acts like an ornery cuss. And I'll tell you why because he has not yet discovered the difference between understanding something in his head and truly believing it in his heart. This man does not actually believe it, and therefore it doesn't change who he really is to the people who so desperately need him to change. The context of the passage of Scripture here is actually in a story. Most of the Proverbs are little pithy statements that are made and then the author moves on to the next one. But this one is actually encased in the story and the story is that 
of a miser. Maybe you know what a miser is. This is what, the, well, this, is what this uh, proverb is saying. You can check out the fuller context later on this afternoon. And let me put it in a contemporary terms. Let's say that you have to go on a trip and you have a friend here that knows a friend there and he arranges for you to stay at their house. And so you arrive in the city and you come to the home and your host invites you in and seems very, very delightful. As a matter of fact, they say to you, I have to go to work tomorrow, but I know you need to stay here at the house all day. I'll be home later on in the afternoon, but I just want to say to you, make yourself at home and help yourself to the fridge. Just whatever would make you comfortable. You think, well, how nice. And so the man goes off to work and you stay at the house and wake up in the morning and your stomach's ground just a little bit. And so you remember the phrase, help yourself to the fridge. And so you go and get a bagel and you toast it. You get some cream cheese out of the refrigerator and you put it on and grab yourself a glass of orange juice from his refrigerator. And it's quite satisfying. As it rolls around to lunchtime, your stomach begins to growl again, and you remember the phrase, help yourself to the refrigerator. And so you go and you get yourself a piece of bread, you once again toast it, you find some turkey and some ham, some pickles and some lettuce and tomatoes and a little mayo, low-fat mayo, and you put it on there with some... uh, with some, uh, you get a bag of chips and a glass of milk and yum, yum, it's all good. And then you remembered as you're wrapping up that there was in the fridge uh, one remaining piece of banana cream pie. Mm. And so you helped yourself to the banana cream pie, washed up all the dishes. Later on in the afternoon, the host comes home and he greets you with a smile on his face. But about 10, 15 minutes in to the, to the encounter, he starts giving you the cold shoulder. And you can't figure out why. And you never did figure out why. And so you go back home. And a week later, you're talking to your friend who set this all up. And he says, man, I don't know what happened to your friend. But, man, he gave me the cold shoulder. He says, yeah, the gossip mill has already come back to me. Um, Did you help yourself to his refrigerator? And she said, yeah, well, you shouldn't have done that. Well, he told me, oh, yeah, yeah, he'll say things like that. But I forgot to tell you, he is a miser. It doesn't matter what he says. He knows it's politically correct and appropriate to help yourself to the refrigerator, but at the end of the day, he's a miser. He can help himself, but be aggravated with you for actually doing it. What is he saying? He's saying that this friend that you were staying with has a belief system in his heart that automatically causes him to be a miser. And until he removes these beliefs, that cause him to be a miser, he will always be a miser. He cannot help himself. That's why in the book of Proverbs chapter four and verse 23, the author writes, above all else. Now, if you're new to the Bible, anytime the Bible says above all else, underline, pay attention, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Be careful, guard the door of your heart because whatever you let in, even if it is a lie, will make up the content of your belief system and that belief system automatically guaranteed has turned around and made you into the kind of person you are today and you can't do anything about it until you go back into the heart and adjust the belief system. Am I making sense, church? Okay, let me give you a positive example from history. Uh, There's a guy named Rodney Stark, Dr. Rodney Stark, a renowned sociologist from Washington who was mesmerized by Jesus. He was mesmerized and also referred to him as a marginalized guy. He could not understand how Jesus did what he did. Now, you've got to keep in mind, Rodney Stark was not a follower of Jesus Christ, but a renowned sociologist, and he could not understand how Jesus pulled all of this off. He said how the marginalized Jesus, who came from nowhere, was from a carpenter's family, gathered 12 other ragamuffin guys around him, and collectively, over 300 in 50 years, they were able to reach 56.5% of the entire Western world, or how this marginalized Jesus could start with the guy from nowhere, Jesus, and end up in 350 years with 33,800,000 plus followers. He couldn't believe it, so he engaged in research. 
using applied sociology that would impress his colleagues. And in, in, in no way did he bring in the God factor into the equation. And he recorded his results in a little book entitled The Rise of Christianity, How the Obscure, Marginalized Jesus Movement <laughs> Became the Dominant Religious Force in Just a Few Centuries. And in the book, if you were to read it, he uncovers what he believes are about eight reasons Christianity rose so quickly. Can I give you just two of them? You interested? The first one has to do with two worldwide epidemics that broke out. The first one in AD 125, the second one in AD 250. The first believed to be measles, the second believed to be smallpox. In both cases, the outbreaks of these epidemics ended up killing one-fourth to one-third of the entire Western population. Can you imagine being in a, an environment, in a culture where people are dropping like that? So in his research that's all documented, uh, Rodney Stark says during both of these epidemics, the pagans, those who followed the mythological gods, religious people, whenever the first sign of a family member uh, was infected with the disease, they would kick their family member out into the street to die alone. Now, it makes really common sense when you think about it. I mean, follow the logic with me, uh, going into the living room of the pagan and hear the conversation. Johnny, we'll say his name was Johnny. Johnny, uh, you know that we love you. We've always provided a roof over your house. We've provided food for you, shoes for your feet. But Johnny, you got the bug. Uh, and I mean, newsflash, Johnny, you're going to die. And here's the deal, Johnny. We know that you also love us and we don't currently have the bug. And so we know you love us so much that you don't mind us kicking you out into the street to die alone because Johnny, you certainly, right, don't want us to die as well. And Johnny would say, well, where am I supposed to go? And the parents would say, you can go anywhere you want. You just can't stay here. And out on the street they went. Documenting his research, Rodney Stark says, the Christians did not do that to their family members. He documents at the first sign that a member of a Christian family got the disease, instead of throwing them into the street, they actually kept them in the home and they nursed them and they cared for them and they caressed them and they looked them in the eyes with deep love. But he said they didn't stop there. He documents that actually the Christians went out into the street and they took the pagans that were cast out in the street by their family members and they brought them into their home. Even though these are the people that would ridicule and persecute them, they brought them into their home and they nursed them and they loved them and they caressed them and they looked them in the eyes with deep love. And doc Dr. Stark said, in doing so, they took the disease into themselves. And in fact, many Christians died because of that. But he says, Dr. Stark says, in the end, it created an avalanche of growth for Christianity. Why? Well, number one, what kind of family do you want to be a part of? the kind that kicks you out at the first sign of a disease, the kind that kicks you out at the first sign that you have made a mistake, or the kind of family that loves you unconditionally through the thick and the thin. People began to flock to the church for that very reason. But Dr. Stark said there was something that we know now that they didn't know then, and that is this, that when a person is nursed and caressed and cared for, even in the absence of any medications, it increases the person's chance of survival by two-thirds, thus reinforcing what the Bible has taught us from the very beginning, and that is this. The most powerful medicine in the world is the medicine of unconditional love. Can I get an amen? amen. And as a result of these heroic acts, the church grew by the millions. Hey, let me give you one more example. Back in the Roman Empire days, the uh, women were highly devalued. 
As a matter of fact, um, women during that time, in an effort to control population, uh, it was legal uh, for a mother and a father to engage in infanticide if the baby that was born was a girl. And he actually, Dr. Stark, actually cites examples of a man writing a letter to his wife when he was out of town and basically just saying, hey, I'm going to bring home what you want me to bring home. It's been a good trip. I uh, hope the pregnancy's going okay. And hey, if the baby's born while I'm gone, if it's a girl, kill it. If it's a baby boy, name him so-and-so. I'll be back in just a little bit. Hugs and kisses. Bye-bye. It was that kind of a letter. Just in the middle of it, kill her. They engaged in that. Not only that, uh, but also abortion was legal back in the Roman Empire. But more than that, a woman who was over the age of 40 who got pregnant was often forced to have an abortion. <laughs> Dr. Stark observed that over time, there ended up being more men than there were women. Duh. <laughs> and so what they ended up doing, uh, they ended up um, basically giving a, a father's daughter over into marriage to a full-grown man before the girl reached puberty. He actually cites an example where one rich man was able to get another man's daughter at the age of 11. That's just plumb sick. But not only that, uh, but when a woman's husband died and she became a widow, they were forced to remarry one of these thugs that they didn't love, uh, or if they didn't within six months, the land that was in the name of her deceased husband would go back to the state. Dr. Stark then records and documents that the church engaged in none of this. They did not have the influence that we have today in the United States, but they refused to engage. They did not commit acts of infanticide against their little girls. They did not engage in abortion. Uh, they did not ever reduce the age of when their daughters were given over into marriage. And they provided an alternative to widows whose husbands died. If you read Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7, this all becomes clear. The church is growing by leaps and bounds because Gentile Greek widows are flocking the church as an alternative to marrying some old thug that they don't love. And the church is taking care of them and have to create a ministry led by a guy named Stephen. Remember that? Because people are coming to the church, particularly women, and the church began to grow. Duh. But Dr. Stark said something else happened that they didn't know was happening then. In Christianity, there ended up being more women than there was men. There were men. And so what ended up happening is Christian women began to marry pagan men. And when the pagan men married these highly convicted, spiritually minded women, they experienced what Dr. Stark calls a secondary conversion. And this family unit now was growing up their family in the principles of Christianity. When they had children, they didn't kill their daughters. They didn't engage in abortion. They raised them in the Christian faith. They got married. They had children. They didn't kill their little girls. They didn't engage in abortion. Then the next generation and the next generation, he says, over time, it created a tsunami of growth for Christianity. What an amazing, amazing story. <laughs> Dr. Stark comes to the end of his book and reluctantly, he draws this conclusion. It's a little academic, but I'll interpret it in a moment. He says, therefore, as I conclude this study, I find it necessary to confront what appears to be the ultimate factor in the rise of Christianity. Let me state my thesis. Central doctrines of Christianity prompted and sustained attractive, liberating, and effective social relations and organizations. I believe that it was the religion's particular doctrines that permitted Christianity to be among the most sweeping and successful revitalization movements in history, and it was the way these doctrines took on actual flesh, the way they directed organizational actions and individual behavior that led to the rise of Christianity. In a nutshell, what he's saying is that, is that these early Christians actually believed. They took these unbelievable doctrines, he calls them, beliefs, and they moved them from head to heart. Why did they care for the sick? 
because they believed Jesus when he said, we are to love our enemy as ourselves. They actually believed it. Why did they care for the person who was ridiculing them and persecuting them? Because they actually believed in their heart when Jesus said that we are to love our enemy. And Dr. Stark says this belief was so significant, so embedded in their heart that it took on flesh and automatically activated them. Why did they treat women with value? Because they looked at the life and pattern of Jesus and saw how he treated the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the sinful woman that busted into their uh, dinner fellowship with a bunch of Jewish men where Jesus was the host. They believe the writings and teachings of the apostle, like the apostle Paul, who lays down this radical idea for followers of Jesus. He says, there are no longer in Christ is going to be a distinction in value between a Jew and a Gentile, holy Toledo. There's no longer gonna be a distinction in value between the slave and the free. You've gotta be kidding me. And finally, there's no longer gonna be a distinction in value, not in the church, not in Christ, between a man and a woman. And the church actually believed that and it changed everything. Who they became as people was completely driven by their belief system. A belief system does not reside in the head, but it resides in the heart. And if you could do a spiritual x-ray of these people, you would find their x-ray of their spiritual heart looks awful similar to the spiritual x-ray of the heart of Jesus. They embraced these same powerful beliefs. Listen to this. In the end, Dr. Stark became a Christian. In 2004, he said he was personally incapable of religious belief, but now after studying the church, he said, I cannot help myself. The greatest draw to Christ is his followers who increasingly day by day walk this earth and live like he did. It is so magnetic and it is undeniably the best and most truthful way to live. If you've experienced even a taste of that, shout out, even you students, amen. amen. This is what I call the believe revolution, the believe revolution, and this is what I want for you as we begin this journey. I need you to understand it. Becoming like Jesus is your destiny, and to get there, you need to understand what I'm about to teach you. The journey begins with the passion to be like Jesus. Fill this out in your notes, to be like Jesus. You look at the life of Jesus and what's taught in the scriptures and you desire to be like Jesus. So we have identified in your Believe book, which we're gonna invite you to get a hold of and bring with you every uh, Sunday to the gathering. Uh, we're going to actually end with these top 10 virtues that God envisions you becoming. Love, joy, peace, Self-control, now wouldn't that be something? Hope, patience, anybody want that? Kindness and goodness, oh, I need that. Faithfulness, gentleness, and humility. We're gonna spend a week on each one of these to make sure you understand from the scriptures what God is inviting you to become. But here's the deal. You cannot become like Jesus by simply willing it. You cannot become like Jesus by trying harder. If you're struggling with joy in your life right now, you can't simply say, man, today was a rough day, but tomorrow, by golly, I'm gonna wake up and I'm just gonna be more joyful. It doesn't work that way. In order for you to become like Jesus, the scripture is going to teach us you need to think like Jesus. And so we have identified the top 10 beliefs found in the scriptures that drive transformation. And this is where we're going to actually begin starting next week. Week one, we're going to look at who is God. Then God is a personal God. We're going to look at the topic of salvation, the Bible, identity in Christ, the church humanity, compassion, stewardship, and God's view of the future or eternity. We're gonna spend a week on each one to make sure you understand what you're being invited to believe. But here's the deal. In order to become like Jesus, you have to think like Jesus, but not just from the head, but you must think like Jesus from the so how does one go about thinking like Jesus from the heart? The Bible teaches over and over again, to be like Jesus, you have to think like Jesus. To think like Jesus, you have to act 
like Jesus. And so we're going to dive into the scriptures beginning to end and look at the spiritual disciplines or the practices that were engaged in the lives of the saints, particularly the lives, the life of Jesus, to see how he practiced his life with the Father. And what you're going to see is that these spiritual practices do a very important thing in our life. They take the ideas, the beliefs that are in the head, and with consistent practice of these disciplines, they bombard the heart with these truths and give real competition to the lies that are currently coming after you with the goal that you might actually embrace these in your heart. And so we're going to cover the top 10 spiritual practices that you're invited to engage in in our second 10 weeks. And we're going to look at the practice of worship and prayer in Bible study, of single mindedness, of total surrender, Jesus's personal favorite, biblical community, spiritual gifts, offering my time, giving my resources and sharing my faith. When you engage in these practices, on a consistent basis, eventually your heart is going to believe. And the goal of spiritual formation is for you to become aware of the current beliefs that are driving your life. Everybody hearing my voice right now, you have become the person that is the sum total of the belief system you currently have. Our goal is for you to become self-aware of what those beliefs are. Many of you don't know what they are. Confront them and then invite you to have the God rip those out of you and place them instead with his beliefs that lead you to an awesome path. And when your heart Listen to this. When your heart says, yes, this is what I actually believe from the heart, the Bible says it will automatically begin transforming you into the kind of person he predestined you to be, and that is into the person of Christ. When a person who wants to become like Jesus begins to think like Jesus, they must then act like Jesus. And when those beliefs take up residence in the heart, It will complete the revolution, and by golly, little by little, you will become like Jesus. Okay, but here's the problem. Uh, You can't do this. I know this was a nice, wonderful talk, and I get to the end, and I go, it's really not possible. So I hope you've enjoyed my talk today. (laughs) Let's pray, and we'll be done. This is true. You can't actually do this. The Bible says the sin nature that you picked up from the very first Adam is running through your veins in such a way that it is going to fight you the entire way. It is going to wear you down. And in the end, the scripture says it is impossible to beat the power of the flesh in this journey. And not only that, but you're going to have negative people. You should spend the least amount of time possible with negative people, but you can't get away from them. And these negative people are going to be constantly drawing you away from this journey. And finally, and most importantly, and most powerfully, the Bible teaches there are spiritual forces, which is the real enemy that we cannot see, but oh, don't underestimate. He is like a lion, the Bible says, roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. And he's got his chops on you. He and his team are fully set on sidetracking you from God and your ordained destiny. There is only one solution to overcoming this. Are you ready? It is found in a person. I want you to write it in the center of your circle. He is the Holy Spirit. When you crossed the line of faith and became a follower like Rodney Stark, convinced that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life for the forgiveness of your sin, the Bible teaches that simultaneously the Holy Spirit was deposited in you to empower you for this assignment. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit speaks directly to your spirit, bypassing the mind and the flesh and speaking directly to where it really matters. And the Bible teaches that if you will learn to say yes, to the illumination and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will be signaled to take over and overcome the obstacles of the flesh, of negative people, and yes, even our spiritual enemy, because the Holy Spirit, at the end of the day, can kick the stuffing out of the enemy with one hand tied behind his back. And here's a little secret that most people miss, but it is the key to your success. You don't become like Jesus 
by trying harder. Please do not exhaust yourself. You become like Jesus by yielding harder to the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. When you say yes, when you yield to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit empowers you in a supernatural way. That is why if you're hearing these words today in our student center, online, uh, anywhere you're hearing these words and you have never accepted Christ as your savior, you never, like Dr. Stark, have crossed over the line of faith and said yes to Jesus, this life is not available to you. Please do not try this without the Holy Spirit. And so I'm inviting you today, before we begin this journey, to give your life over to Christ, just like Dr. Stark did. And when you do this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and empower you for the journey. Right now, I am trusting that the Holy Spirit is hovering outside of you, not inside of you, but outside of you, convicting you and nudging you and saying, yes, today is the day. Begin this journey of believing today by accepting the power of the Holy Spirit. Boom. Listen to this. Research shows that even for Christians, only 13% of all Christians ever experienced this destination. Only 13%. Your destiny is to be named among the 13%. Your destiny is to experience the awesomeness of living like Christ. Your destiny is to live a courageous life that reaches out unconditionally to people who are hurting, who are sick, who are down and out, who are far from God, and minister to them simply like Jesus would minister to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. Your destiny Close your eyes and envision it with me. Is that when the first pancake comes off the griddle, you offer it up to your brother. You offer it up to your sister. Because like Jesus, you can wait for the next one. And when this happens, church, all throughout this church, all throughout the city, the Believe Revolution is just going to spin out of control. And it's going to be an amazing thing to see. So next week, we're going to begin our journey in Believe with chapter one, with the very first Believe. We're going to start with where we need to start, and that is with our belief in God. Who is God? The Bible teaches, A.W. Tozier reinforces that what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. Next week, I'm going to tell you why. So I encourage you, uh, the gun sounds today. I'm going to invite you to read. Uh, chapter one of your Believe book. Students, read chapter one. I'm going to invite you to answer the five questions that are embedded in it. I'm going to ask you to memorize the key idea and the key scriptures. If you weren't here last week, we're going to take the time to pass the microphone to every single person to make sure that you have memorized it. We've allotted the time for that. That's called accountability. Check into it. It's the only way you get anywhere. Not really. And then when you come on Sunday, we're going to talk about this. But before you do, let me encourage you, if you're not in a Believe small group, I want to encourage you to get in one. It's going to really make the difference. And we have, listen to this, uh, 281 Believe groups started here in the Kansas City area. Is that unbelievable? The most brand new groups started in the history of this church, and we have people that are ready to receive you. You can go out into the Connections area at Speedway or the Connections area here and find out more. But tonight at 630 in the North Sanctuary here, those small group leaders are going to show up and they're going to invite you into their Believe group. So I want to encourage you to join me and be with them as we make sure you have this final piece in the puzzle, a Believe small group. Church, start your engines. Are you ready to go? I ask you, are you ready to go? All right, stand to your feet and convince me all over the place. Students, I want to hear from you. Ready? Are you ready to go? Yes. Woo! God bless. That's good stuff.